to Literature Out Loud, sponsored by Rune, the Robert Morris University Literary Magazine, and by RMU Radio and TV. I'm Erica Sablowski. Joining me today in the fairy room of Massey Hall are poets Jan Beatty, Tess Berry, and Dr. Lawson. I thought we'd have a Ron Robin reading today, with each of our poets reading a poem and then moving on to the next reader. I'll introduce each of you as your first turn comes up, and our first reader is Jan Beatty. Jan Beatty is here at Robert Morris today as a featured reader for our party to celebrate the new edition of Rune. So thanks for spending time with us, Jan. Jan yeah, I'm happy to be here. <laughs> I'm glad you are here. Jan Beatty is so well known both in Pittsburgh and nationally that she hardly needs an introduction. She heads Carleg University's undergraduate creative writing program and the Mad Women in the Attic Writers Group here in Pittsburgh. Her first full-length book, or fourth full-length book, The Switching Yard, was published in 2013 by Pittsburgh University Press, and Jan is no stranger to radio. She's hosted WYEP's poetry show, Prosody, for 20 years. Her work was included in 2013's Best American Poetry, and the Huffington Post named her as one of the top 10 women writers whose work should be required reading. Welcome, Jan. Thanks. So I guess I'll start with, with a poem uh, from Switching Yard, which is my new book. Uh, the poem is called Visitation at Gogama, and uh, uh, just a few ideas about it. I was born in a place called Rosalia Foundling Home in the Hill District and uh, found out later that my birth father was a Canadian hockey player and uh, so I took this train ride across Canada and some wild things started happening. This is called Visitation at Gogama. No shirt was drying his long hair with a towel and staring at the train. He looked about 30. I saw my birth father young and alive. He stepped out of a brown house with a white sign on the side. Wild Bill, his nickname in big black letters. I saw him the way he was before he made me, beautiful and astonishing in his maleness. I tell you, this is my family tree. No noble phrases, no graveyards on the hill, just visitations. Now pieces of discarded track, explosion of purple wildflowers along the side, solid wall of rock five feet from the train, then a river, bridge, floating leaves that look like giant lily pads. Is that possible? We're approaching the town of Gogama, Ontario, small railroad town erased by the diesel engine. There's a bar called Restaurant Tavern and a meat market called Meat Market and a motel called Motel. <laughs> no other names. In this place of no naming or maybe first naming, I decide I'll call myself Bastard. It's plain and accurate. You can count on it. We approach a signal, a woman in a black tank top with killer arms, slouches, and a gray Buick century at the crossing, and a modified gangster, lean. I decide I love her. Call her free. And that was Jan Beatty. Our second reader is Tess Berry. Tess holds an MA in English from the University of Pittsburgh and an MFA in poetry from Carla University. She was a finalist for North American Reviews 2012 and 2013 James Hurst Poetry Prize. A semi-finalist for the Tucson Festival of Books Literary Awards 2013, Tess Berry was long listed for the 2013 Fish International Poetry Prize and a finalist for Aesthetica Magazine's 2013 Poetry Award. Her poems have most recently appeared or forthcoming in Aesthetica Magazine, a North American Review. She is a fellow of the Western Pennsylvania Writing Project and teaches English and creative writing at Robert Morris University. Tess? Thank you. It's wonderful to be here with Jan. So um, my first poem I'm, gonna, I'm going to be reading uh, is a poem uh, that came out of the experience of um, having deja vu. So the sense of having been somewhere before and I had this experience very keenly uh, when I visited old San Juan, Puerto Rico. Uh, it was a very unsettling experience, uh, and this poem uh, is a reflection of that. Between water and the sun's bright glare. Fort San Felipe del Moro rose up from a bluff high above the Atlantic. 
As we drove along the sea, I saw giant sails blow in and out. I said to my then fiance, I remember seeing this before as we drove in from the airport, but we hadn't come that way. And when we parked, I said the ships in the bay looked ancient as though they'd been rigged for some historic celebration. He looked at me like I was crazy, said he couldn't see any ships. And the closer we got to the bluff, the more frightened I became. As we mounted the steps to the fort, I looked up again and saw a woman who looked like me, only she was wearing a long white dress and looking out towards the sea, seeing the sails I saw, her hand bent over her eyes to shade them because the sun was high, making it impossible to see anything clearly. I saw her there and turned, ran down the hill and back to the car. I left him with a woman in a white dress turned towards the sea who looked just like me. When I reached the car, I turned to see thousands of ships in San Juan Bay and that woman still standing there, her dress billowing in and out. Scanning the horizon, almost frantically, she was searching for a lover, a husband, caught somewhere between water and the sun's bright glare. Thank you, Tess. Our third reader is Dr. John Lawson. John teaches writing and rhetoric here at Robert Morris and has founded our show, Literature Out Loud. He's also faculty advisor for Rune, the Robert Morris University Literary Magazine. His poetry collection, Generations, was published by St. Andrew's Co College Press in 2007. Dr. Lawson. Thanks, Erica. Um, what a great joy it is to be here with all of you. Um, the first time I read Jan's poem, I initially confused the title of it with Golgotha, instead of Gogama. Um, and I think that shows that my Christian upbringing, despite my lack of a Christian faith today, um, sort of pervades my perception of the world. Um, pursuant to that idea, this poem is called Bad Jesus. Ah. Thank you. When bad Jesus comes around, he smells fresh from the shower, soaked and powdered, smiling in snow white laundered robes that flow like bountiful forgiveness from his molten eye. He kneels to pray, I kneel down too and feel his gentle touch that disentangles the lost sheep of my spirit from the brambles. The heavens open, etc. Then he takes a seat beside me on the couch to watch football and asks me if, if I've got any soft drinks, any nachos or pretzels. And I'm all like, hey, you're God, right? Why don't you know already? <laughs> and anyway, why can't you zap us up some snacks right here and save me a trip to the refrigerator? But when the good Jesus comes, I wake in the dark and listen to him snuffling around the cold, dead campfire Searching food and finding none, he roars and tears the thin skin of my tent with a savage paw. A grizzly bear with grizzly breath, he snaps and slashes, chasing me, bitten and wounded, deep into the midnight forest. I hear him crashing through the undergrowth just inches behind me as I run, and I yell back over my shoulder, Okay, okay, I believe, now go away. But he keeps coming, and eventually I trip, and he holds me down and leisurely strips my carcass bit by bit. And that was Dr. John Lawson reading his poem, Bad Jesus. This is Robert Morris University's Literature Out Loud, and I would like to turn over the round robin next to Jan Beatty. What's next? I'm going to read that. Another poem from The Switching Yard, and uh, uh, this one, uh, on a similar topic, I, I met my birth mother when I was in my 30s at this place called uh, Catholic Social Services, and back then I wore dresses, that was a long time ago, and I had two dresses, a um, blue one and a red one, and I wore the red one, when I got there she had the blue one on, which was kind of strange. So this is called My Mother Was a Dress. 
For years, I was wearing her. She was cotton, her neck a blue V for her blue vagina that birthed six babies. She had a vanilla string around her waist, even though she was hooker red at heart, like me. I wore her for two years along with a sister dress of deep cherry. When I went to meet her the first time at Catholic Social Services, I wore the cherry and she wore the blue vagina. We thought that genetics had made us go to Joseph P. Horns to buy the V, but decided we both lived near the bloodless department store. After that, I took her off, stopped wearing her, didn't want her touching my body anymore. I prefer to think it's all animal, the way the V opens my neck to predators, the way she scissors her legs open to my father, the way the dress hugs my hips then falls. Just like she said, she hugged me once before falling away, switching me out for sale. And that was Jan Betty. I would like to turn it over to Tess again. That was wonderful, Jan, one of my favorite poems. Um, I'm also uh, going to read a mother poem. I write a lot of poems about my mother. Uh, she is a remarkable person and uh, a very eccentric um, person as well, a poet. This is a poem that was inspired by a visit to her house uh, where I encountered photographs of us as children. There are 10 of us. She gave birth to 10 children um, in her paintings and it inspired this poem. Girl in a Pasture. My mother imagined us in paintings. She filled her expensive prints and oil canvas portraits with photos of the lives we lived placed my brother James in Van Gogh's wheat fields. We're 12 years old in baseball uniform. Jim holds a bat, awaits a pitch. The first five of her 10 children nestled together in olive trees among crows and wheat. Four of her granddaughters in swirly Christmas dresses stare out from Surratt's Sunday afternoon on the island of La Grande Jotte. Passing down her cool hallway, I find myself standing behind the boys in Winslow Homer's pasture. They sit blithely, unaware of me. I am three, holding sunflowers and showing my belly. Oh, I love that. Wow. Um, I'm experiencing right now, it's the first time I've heard that poem, and I'm experiencing this um, surprise that comes so often with good writing where I just recognize that somebody else has had the same experience I have, namely of living in landscape paintings that I've seen. Um, that's great. I, I don't think I can take credit for that. I think that's my, my mother is just this very kind of imaginative person, but that, that was like a physical manifestation of her, her, what I see as her imagination, which was such a blessing to have a mother who was so imaginative. Yeah. Well, um, I'm going to read a poem called Millipede, and it's based on an actual incident where I found a millipede. And, um, but it also turned into a metaphor for me of the writing process, um, because I find that when I write the things that speak the best, that come together, um, it's kind of like a millipede coming out of the drain. Millipede. I wake up worried that no poems have come. Perhaps I'm losing my second sight, and from now on I'll be stuck in one moment after another. Perhaps God or my God has abandoned me. I go into the bathroom and find another millipede in the bathtub. One day I'll remember to complain to the landlord. I watch for a while. The millet bead tries to scramble up the side, but each time slides back to the bottom. It dawns on me that today there will be no poetry. The millipede has come in its place. I pick up a fat volume of classical literature and slam it down on the millipede repeatedly. Finally, every one of its thousand legs has stopped wiggling. The shock of the bathtub feels good in my arm. This millipede, at least, can't crawl across my face in the dark. 
I wiped the clear goo off the book with a tissue. If poems are to come, let them come on their own, scrambling up out of the drains toward the light. If I see one, I'll trap it in the bathtub. Today, there need be no poetry. I pick up my pen and start writing. Thank you, Dr. Lawson. Back <coughs> to uh, Jim Beatty again. Thanks. Um, well, that poem was freaking me out. <laughs> <laughs> but but I, like the, I love the idea of poems in the, in the bathtub, though, or in the shower. OK, uh, I'm going to read a, um, a poem about my other father. Um, my, my other father was a steel worker and, uh, um, who then punched his foreman, and then, then he became a salesman. <laughs> But, uh, and this is, I write a lot of poems about work, his work. It's called Company Car. To make sure they took out the back seat, left a dirty hole for hauling supplies. My father worked for American Tobacco when smoking was glamorous and profits fatter. We set up little red and white folding chairs in the back hole of the Ford Fairlane sedan, 1960 black with red vinyl interior, me and my sister. Seven years before Woodstock, we rock and rolled crazy down the street. I was 10. I didn't know the history of the company's store. Laughing and falling over, my father's eyes in the rear view, my mother scowling. I didn't know the shame of it. Our screams of stupid joy reminding them of what we were, working class, afraid of being seen riding around, Afraid my father would lose his job. He couldn't take us to school or to church, but he did. He was the builder of our lives, carving a way through the lies around us. Is that why he yelled so much at our silliness? Where did he put his rage as he pulled the black car into the garage and turned the key? I saw him late one night under the side house light. He took it and put it stone by stone in the driveway wall, heaving and radiant. I saw him give rage a body, breathe it alive. Yeah, I'd like to move on to uh, Tess again. Oh, thank you. That yes. was wonderful, Jan. I love that poem. Um, I'm going to read a poem that was inspired by the poet Ruth Stone. Uh, she died in the last couple of years. and. Uh, she writes uh, in a kind of folksy way, I think, um, that reminds me of my the people that I grew up with and the way they speak. So this poem was inspired by her, her poetry. It's called Raspberries. I started out in western Pennsylvania hills with wild raspberry and blackberry bushes and my mother's apple field, bread and ripe fruit and fresh milk. My mother cleaned the carpet right off the floor my father was a Troy Hill boy who played piano and smoked Pall Malls and drank whiskey. He won my mother in a dance contest. Who wouldn't learn to jitterbug for a prize like her? They took a train to Cape Cod for a honeymoon and bought hats for their mothers. They sailed all the way from the Cape to 10 children. My whole life has been ripe with wild fruit. There is no point in wondering what I'll come to. All the men I've loved had left feet. I was innocent until I got myself a good pair of rain boots. With my first words, I wrote my own path straight to New York, all night accents, brick stoops. I left there like a mad dog running free, like our Dusty who got himself killed down the street, chasing the neighborhood boys. He ran smack into a fender. We buried him up in the woods after a proper funeral. No amount of experience can shake the ripeness out of me or my mother or my father who did, didn't just win a bride with his right feet and big shoes. He won a green thumb. Hey, uh, what are the uh, things that happened to me? Can I see that? Sure. Um, 
as an elderly fellow is that I keep hearing new epitaphs for myself, and I heard one in this poem. Um, uh, you ran a set until you got yourself a good pair of rainbows? <laughs> no. It's, my whole life has been ripe with wild fruit. I'd love to have that on my gravestone. Yeah. Um, well, it's yours. <laughs> thanks. You're welcome to it. <laughs> I'll have to. Uh, I hope it doesn't. I hope it's not needed for decades to come. <laughs> I'll have to put an in-text citation though after it probably, right? Yeah. Um, so my last poem in our round robin is going to be one that I had published actually in one of my favorite journals, which is called J Journal. It's uh, New Writings on Justice, and it's published by the uh, John Jay College of Law. Um, and it kind of comes out of the fact that I'm not sure a lot of us have had much faith in the judicial system all along, but whatever faith we used to have is pretty well going away now. Um, and this is written from that perspective. It's called Judicious. And uh, I'm in it, I'm enacting the role of a contractor who does residential work like roofing and windows and gutters. <clears throat> Judicious. How you sang for joy to receive my modest bid to replace the aluminum gutters on your mansion in the far west suburbs. You gathered your family, two daughters, a Dalmatian, and a pimpled son, to shake my calloused hand, and later your pretty wife brought iced tea out to the yard before I climbed the ladder. But after the job was finished and the last check handed over, you began your calls to say first that your boy had found a fallen nail. Would I be kind enough to rent a magnet, clear the yard? Next, you complained a gutter screen had blown off in a storm. Would I come by and put it back? When these and similar requests continued to the seventh month, I spoke to my attorney who reminded me you're a lawyer too, and so advised to keep you happy, far from court, because the judge who'd likely hear a suit plays squash every Saturday with Reginald, your older brother. Unfortunately, we are starting to run short on time, but I would like to ask our featured reader, Jan, to read us one more poem, if that's all right. Sure. Thank you. Uh, this is called Delicious. I'm looking for clothes to put my body in. At the family gathering, my sisters-in-law wear sundresses and strappy sandals, which are lovely, and it's sunny out, but the Kenneth Cole men's shirt I got on sale seems out of place, like the way I need to wear a lot of metal that can double as weapons if needed. And ever since I cut off all my hair years ago to avoid being mistaken for a woman who wants a man in dockers, I search websites for men's shoes and shirts to fit Stores for men with elegant small feet, who I imagine to be my cosmic brothers. Then one sister-in-law talks about the new baby, the new baby. So I switch to the men's talk about the new Camaro, the new Camaro, and the NFL's jacked up penalties on hitting, but always swing back to the women, who have a watery way about them I love, who are talking about the zesty seasoning for the bean salad, which is, in fact, delicious. Well, thank you for joining us today, Jan. And thank, thank you. And thank you, Tess. Thank you. And it's great to be here with John and Jan. It's been great to hear, and thank you to Dr. Lawson. It's been great to hear all, each, of your po each of your poems. It's really quite an experience to hear each of you read them. And today, this is Literature Out Loud, sponsored by Rune, the Robert Morris Literary Magazine, and RMU Radio and TV. Please be sure to check out the new online edition of Rune. And thanks again to our readers, Jan Beatty, Tess Berry, and John Lawson. I'm Erica Sobolowski. Thank you for listening. Thanks, Erica. Thank yeah, you, thank Erica. You. Thank you.